All right, so we're back at it again. So we're here to have a quick, uh, well, quick, 30 minutes uh, Q&A um, regarding AppSec or any kind of related topic. Do we also have Vicky connected? All right, awesome. Well, hi, Vicky. All right, so how it's going to work is that going? we'll... Hi, sorry, there might be a slight delay, so we'll be uh, careful about that. Um, so before we start, I'm curious, I know Vicky, your talk was specifically about how to write better technical doc. Are you guys writing some technical documentation, blogs or books or anything of, of some sort? I'm not, but uh, I probably should start. Okay. Um. Yeah, I, I release from time to time blog posts, and uh, I also talked in the session about the threat metrics, which was quite a significant publication of us. Um, so yeah, and uh, the tips in the session were definitely helpful. All right, awesome. So this is supposed to be a conversation, so Vicky, if you also have questions for people on-prem or live with us, please ask away. If not, what I'll do is I'll go through some of the popular question on Slido. Um, so we do have some. All right, this one is very generic. <laughs> okay. So we're open to any tips and tricks, but what kind of protection can we implement on database of the provider side to prevent an evil consumer from stealing data? Is using a different database an option? to everyone. <laughs> it's fine if we don't have the answer. Perhaps it's a question, too generic question for, for our speaker today. I mean, I'm not a database guy, but I have done a talk about um, basically finding unsecured NoSQL databases out there, and it seemed like the biggest problem was people forgot to put authentication on it, or they forgot and they left it open to the internet. Um, I don't know that you could switch from, say, like Elastic to Mongo. I'm pretty sure that there's very different data structures, but um, basically Security 101 is the only advice that I would give someone. All right, sounds good. Vicky, uh, raise your hand if you have any additional uh, <laughs> comments to add on this question. All right, um, follow-up question. Can we restrict unknown IP addresses with ACL in F5? Uh, if there is indeed an ACL in place, how can we work our way around it? Again, is that too generic? No. <laughs> um, so the F5 is the only place you're going to be able to put an ACL on that's, that's realistic is the management side of the network. Um, so you can either you know, ACL down the management IP or the self IPs. Um, there's, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty robust, though. You're not going to have an easy way of working your way around it. Um, because even using the exploit, you won't be able to view that ACL list because it's going to just kick any request out that's not coming from a trusted network. Um, that's actually how, when we part of the when we secured them at Microsoft, was we had a Microsoft has of course a very robust networking team. We had a network, a full uh, you know private address space that was only for management, and every device before it was even plugged into the network had ACLs applied, so only that trusted network could get to it. So, yeah, good luck. All right, so the next question is specifically for Vicky. Um, any tips for people who aren't native English speaker on writing better technical content? Sure, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I am not a native English speaker myself, and I certainly struggled with writing and even speaking English right, when I first moved to the United States. And I think the most important tip that I have is to do um, intentional practices. So what does that mean, right? Um, getting good at writing takes time and it's very, very important to write a lot, right? Your first few um, pieces would probably suck, but that's okay because you'll get gradually get better over time. But another thing to remember when you're practicing writing is that it's not enough just to write a lot. It's also really important to get um, feedback about your writing, right? So um, when I first moved to the United States, the way that I got better at writing is that I had a writing mentor that would take my pieces and tell me how she would improve the piece. 
Um, but I do understand that. I think that's the best way of actually improve uh, your writing um, a lot in a short time frame. But um, that is not available to everyone, right? Another way that you can um, get feedback from your writing is through grammar checkers. So you can um, install one of those free grammar checking software and run your articles through that grammar checker, see what kind of feedback it's giving you and try to model correct grammar or good sentence structures from the recommendation you get back from Grammar Checker. And another thing you can do is that you can find similar articles online that you think are well-written that talks about the same topic that you are talking about and compare what makes their writing better than yours and what can you improve in your own writing and um, model how they're structuring their articles or structuring their sentences and their word choices as well. All right, awesome tips and tricks. Maybe it can be useful for English speaker as well. All right, um, let's do a question for you, Sin. You see, pardon. It seems that all cases, in all cases, we rely on Kubernetes to be the IDP to the cloud IDP. That means trusting the configuration of the cloud providers, configuration, and key management. Question mark. <laughs> That's a well-written question, but uh, uh, not sure that I understood it. But if it talks about the IDP, it talks about IDP. It does. Yeah. All right. So yeah, I just mentioned it in the word in the session. I didn't get into it, but uh, what I tried to say. I mean, I didn't get into the details, but uh, now uh, cloud providers have the option to trust uh, um, Kubernetes as an IDP, so service accounts. Um, from the cluster or trusted by the cloud provider, and that's uh, another way to authenticate your um, workloads, your pods, um, with the cloud. Um, you can read about, um, for example, in Azure, it's called um, uh, it's called um, Workload uh, Identity Federation, I think, and in the AWS, it's called RSA. So you can read about the whole flow, but generally, it means that the cluster is, tr is trusted as an um, identity provider. All right, thank you. This is more a general question that maybe has nothing to do with your specific talk, but since we're here talking about application security, um, you all know that developer, it's hard for them to take sec security seriously. Um, does anyone's experience and maybe tips and tricks on how to, or has experience on how teaching developer uh, to know when their stuff is broken? Uh, well, I can say that um, well, I work in a like on a product a group at Microsoft, and it's really important to um, to be aware that um, as a developer, um, you should. I mean, I think we do it quite well at Microsoft. Is to really be with security in mind, um, and it could be with education, just to show examples of how simple mistakes at code become uh, vulnerabilities or, mis or misconfigurations. And um, so I think that the main thing is that you need to educate the devs to be with security in mind. Um, it's a generic um, answer, um, but uh, I think it's really important and th that's the first step. And how do you do that? With bribes and cookies? Well, I think that first show examples and to show, I mean, um, to show how sometimes simple, simple things that looks like just little bugs um, can cause to a serious vulnerability, to a serious security issue. Um, I think it's helpful, and um, I think it's another thing is the organizational culture. I mean, to 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 be aware of the security. So. At Microsoft, a big organization, it's obviously it's obviously a thing. So everyone is aware of security, but maybe in smaller um, in dev groups, it's different and it's super important. Um, so I think that's another thing. Absolutely, Nate. I feel like you have something to oh, say yeah, about yeah. this. Um, so uh, in my experience, and this is this is not from the sort of developer side, but I have done a I did another talk about the last F5 vulnerability in 2020. Um, the interesting takeaway from that was the, the 2020 CVE, the path traversal one, it was almost the exact same POC as a Citrix vulnerability from six months prior against their load balancing devices. 
Both of those used a technique that Orange Sai had talked about at Black Hat in 2018. Um, so the advice that I would give is, especially when you're using open source software, um, you need to be paying attention to the ecosystem. Your, your developers and your security teams need to be looking at what the current attack surface is. Um, don't send them to Black Hat just so they can go to parties and drink. They need to be going and looking at these talks and saying, hey, do we use these components in our product? If we do, you know, like quite literally, Orange's his slides had the same POC dot dot semicolon forward slash that was used in both those attacks. So they had 18 months to look at their code and say, hey, is this something that would affect us? Had they done that, they would have realized, yes, it did. So by keeping abreast of, of the, the ecosystem and also looking at your competitors and seeing what types of vulnerabilities affect them, um, you know, in the load balancing world, like I said, they're very similar products. So had, it, had someone from F5 said, hey, Citrix just got whacked with this really bad vulnerability, we do almost the same thing, we should go take a look. Um, you need to be cognizant of what's going on around you and not just head down, you know, writing new shiny features. Like security is boring, we get it, but new shiny is what's going to get you in trouble. All right, thanks. So I'll relay the question to Vicky. Vicky, do you have uh, any tips and tricks on how to uh, onboard Dev into the security journey? Sure, I think I can share one of my experiences. That's sort of like my aha moment in security, right? Before I got into security, I was actually a developer and I wrote lots of lots of code. And because I was a web developer, um, a lot of the vulnerabilities that I studied as a security person actually relates to the code that I wrote for my de development job, right? So one of the great aha moments I had about security and how to teach developer security is that I went back to one of the projects that I made when I was a developer and I just started to find like all of these different ways to exploit it, right? And that really um, showed me what the experience um, should be like when we're teaching developers security, it should be about context, right? We should make it relevant to their work. We should make it understand this is exactly why um, this is bad. And this is what the attacker can do with your customers, with your clients and with your data. I think um, grounding uh, the security education in that sort of context is very important into making people actually care. Absolutely. Thank you for that, Vicky. Um, let's jump into a different topic. Um, I believe this question is for Nate. For load balancers, would a honeypot based on your lab setup catch anything interesting, you think? Oh, absolutely. Um, I believe that Kevin Beaumont, who goes by Gossy the Dog on Twitter, set up a F5 honeypot um, shortly after this vulnerability came out. Um, I know that people, as soon as, these, as soon as these vulnerabilities have come out, different security groups have set up honeypots just to see what sorts of exploit payloads are coming in. Um, so I guess you, in theory, could set one up on your own internal network to sort of like maybe try to, you know, um, uh, confuse an attacker. However, if I'm an attacker, if I'm playing around in your network, the first thing I'm going to do is see, is this device actually interesting? And if I find it that it's just sitting there with no load balance configuration or it's not passing any traffic, um, I'm going to either assume, okay, this is just a lab box or maybe this is a honeypot. Um, so yes, it could be, it could work. Um, I think it's more useful for sort of the the internet spray of attack payloads and sort of collecting and seeing what the TTPs or you know the IOCs of what's being dropped. All right, awesome. Um, question regarding Kubernetes um, for lateral movement. Why uh, it moves? Sorry, why aren't where pod security policies config mention as it would allow escalating the nut even faster. Maybe this is a trick question. Yeah, <laughs> for Kubernetes lateral movement. So for you, why weren't pods security policies config mention as Security policies config mention. Did you mention that in your talk? Security yeah. Security yeah. <laughs> As it would allow escalating the NUD even faster. All right. Is, is the question is which configurations of the pod can allow us to move to the node faster? We can take the question however we want. <laughs> <laughs> and make it your own. I can select another one uh, if you want. Uh, no, uh, no worries. I, I'm not sure that I understood. But if the quest, if the question is about pod configurations, perhaps let's take it this way. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, 
<laughs> I'm not sure that I'm answering the right question, but um, regarding pod configurations that may lead to lateral movement. So we talked about several in the talk. I mean, we mentioned it really briefly, but uh, privileged container first uh, have full access to the underlying node. We also talk about uh, mounting files. Um, so if we have a pod with the configuration of mounting file into it, um, so it also may lead to lateral movement. Um, then the, there is the whole topic of networking. So for example, you can specify that pod has um, um, has access to the host networking. So there are a bunch of configurations of pods that may lead to lateral movements, if it was the question. Um, and if not, so um, you can ask me again and I'll answer. All right. If not, they can uh, hit you up on Twitter and see <laughs> the real answer for you. All right. Um, for Nate, another question for you. Um, yeah. What do you think of asking for a software bill of material that lists all their dependencies and their version on those propri proprietary devices? Um, I think it's a good idea. And at least uh, in terms of F5, you can somewhat figure it out. There's one of the, the reference links I had in my slides. Um, they do list what operating system versions they use for the management side of things. Um, so you could, you know, take a look and say, what is CentOS 7.3 running? What libraries does it have? Um, those operating systems are not updated the way that we would update our Linux servers. So I think it's during like major revs, like when they go from 11 to 12 or 12 to 13, they'll update to a degree. Um, but your best, I mean, you're not going to get much of a software bill of materials from them as far as I know. Um, unless, of course, you're a big enough customer and you pay them enough money, then that was one of the things that I would have done, which was to say, okay, let me, let me pull this for you. Um, but yeah, and that's, that's only going to be the Linux side of things. If you start asking about like supply chains of where their firmware is coming from and the, the code that's running their ASICs or their FPGAs, um, you're going to have a, a non-trivial time getting that out of them. All right. So, Vicky, maybe a, a question that it's for you, but also for from one of the speakers that could not join us today. So it's kind of a in between or a hybrid question. Um, what do you think about web hooks, and would it be a good target for bug bounties program or any? I don't know if you've written any blogs or anything about it uh, in your experience. Mm -hmm. So I've actually written about webhooks before, and I think they can potentially be a good target for bug bounties. But in reality, I haven't really uh, hunted that much in bug bounty programs um, for webhook related bugs. So I don't really know the answer to that. I think potentially, I don't really know how prevalent it is, though. Do we have any strong opinion? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, sounds good. All right. So I'm reading the question that are remaining. They're quite similar to or uncomprehensive. So <laughs> I won't go through. I won't go uh, give you any like uh, weird question anymore. Um, all right. So thank you guys so much. Uh, please ask them your question privately. If you do, hit them on Twitter or yeah, we're just here to help. So please feel free uh, to reach out. Merci tout le monde.